Well, today, the thing that brought us all here is demonic possession and exorcism, right? Which is the subject of the movie, The Devil Inside. And as I, I, was, as I was watching The Devil Inside, I was struck by a few things that really rang true in a lot of instances in history. A lot of people wonder, why is exorcism affiliated with the church, right? Why are there all these weird Catholic exorcism movies? Well, Jesus Christ was, in fact, an exorcist. And a lot of the healings that he performed in the Gospels, in the Bible, were actually driving out demons out of people in order to heal their disease. Right? So what better place to address healing disease caused by demons than a haunted mental institution? Pretty good, right? So in the film, there were a couple of key things that discussed this, and those were what are the things that are demonic possession. Like, how do you know if you're possessed by a demon? That's something that all of us should really kind of find out, right? <laughs> so we know if we're cool and not possessed by a demon. Well, the first clip that I'd like to show is kind of exhibiting one of the first things, which is prophecy and knowing something that is hidden from view. So if we could show that first clip really quickly, you guys can see what I'm talking about. If you see, she kind of floats up the wall and just cruises up there, which is one of the signs that you are possessed by a demon, is that unusual physical things happen, including levitation. But that was actually really happening. That was a contortionist who was the actress, and it shows her manipulating her limbs. And evidence of cases with demonic possession, and also, again, spirit possession and evangelical possession by God or the Holy Ghost, can have various effects on the body, just like when a mother has to save her child from a car, she can have superhuman strength. So why not, when you're possessed by a demon, have weird stuff happen to your body? It makes sense to me. Exorcism, a lot of people affiliate it with like olden times, but there have been many, many modern incidents. Uh, in, in 2007, in Romania, there was a Catholic priest that was arrested because a nun died during the exorcism that he was performing. Did you guys hear about this on the news? He was 31 years old, this priest, and he was exercising a nun, and in fact she died of the demonic possession that she was reported to contain. But before Catholicism, you guys know what was there and who healed disease, were the shamans, right? The shamans in the different cultures in Mexico were the ones that would heal any kind of physical expression of a disease um, through performing exorcisms on the people involved. What exactly is your uh, experience and um, expertise in the subject? Sure. I mean, I've been studying this kind of material since I was young. My mother was very involved in the occult as well. Uh, I actually, ironically, come from a science background. I went to school for biochemistry and was pre-med, and it was through my medical studies that it kept going back to occultism. Like, all my favorite scientists, in fact, studied alchemy. Right? And by studying the alchemists, I got led down the breadcrumb trail back to the shamans, right? Because alchemy originally comes from Egypt, a lot of people say, and that was shamanic medical healing traditions. So the majority of my experience is related back to science and healing. Have you had paranormal experiences yourself? I have. The first one I had was when I was two years old. I had an out-of-body experience that I told my mother about. Uh, the next day, and I remember because I have a crazy memory, but it's been from the get-go that I kind of have had these kind of things happen around me. Do people actually call you the White Witch? Yes, they do. <laughs> Why are you called the White Witch? White Witch, I like to use the word witch to challenge ignorance because a lot of people affiliate witches with Satan, and as we know throughout history, uh, many women have been burned or murdered uh, because they call themselves a witch, which merely means wise one, which is also what priest means. Witches were officiators of ceremony in the panentheistic religions and pantheistic religions, right? And that term I like to use so that people go, wait a minute, maybe she's not satanic because I'm totally not satanic. And I like to use white because I, I do healing, right? The majority of my MO is to try to help people. I am in it for service, right? I do readings, I work with plants, I do healings. So I use white witch to differentiate it from black magic, which is like, you know, hurting people. My main modality that I practice um, professionally is with herbs. Uh, although I was trained in Chinese medicine, 
acupuncture, Reiki, all those different modalities. Um, and I do a lot of psychological healings with my readings through I Ching, astrology, and tarot readings. You call yourself a self-professed skeptic, but um, where does the line between skepticism and paranormal intersect for you? You know, I mean, if you're saying you're a skeptic, but then you're performing healings, I mean, where, where is that boundary? That's a really good question, and to me, I hope that all skeptics listen. It should be experience, right? I will be skeptical about something. If someone just tells me they saw a unicorn run through the field, I'm going to go to that field and see if there's a unicorn, right? So with paranormal stuff, I'm skeptical. If I can feel it, if I go and I do it, then I'm going to like be more apt to understand it and get a wrangle on it. And that's what I encourage all people to do. You can like talk to someone about the ocean and say, hey, did you hear there's this ocean? Or you can go and you can take a swim, right? So my skepticism is I am going to find out for myself, try and experience it, try to do it. And that's where the line for me is drawn. The difference between the paranormal activity and the demon activity or satanic activity, or, or is it the same thing? That's a very good question. And the line between that gets real fuzzy, right? If you look at the word demon, it didn't get turned into evil until Christianity. Like the demons that the shamans exercised were only spirits and were actually mostly ancestral, genetic, right? From our ancestors, which is like DNA, like a lot of genetic diseases, essentially. But what a demon is comes from the word daemon, which is Greek, which was for angel. And a demon really is just a fallen angel that is expressed on the earth, in the flesh, on the material plane. So the difference between paranormal and demonic, like, for example, in this place, there's probably ghosts. Are those ghosts demons? They're probably not fallen angels. They're just spirits of people. But then what's the difference between an angel and a person, right? Then you get into this whole thing, and that's like an hour-long talk that we can have, right? But it's tricky. What, and knowing the thing, naming the thing, is a big thing, right? That's the diagnosis. That's where you have to go doctor style. How do you know what disease you have and what's the name of the demon that's active in you? Is it a demon or is it Grandma Enid? You know, haunting you, haunting your flesh, haunting your body. There's a lot of variation. And finding out the nature of it is the key to kind of healing the disease. So you're spiritually in tune, obviously, with paranormal and, and things of its ilk, I guess. So being that we are in a notoriously haunted location, what do you feel about this place? Do you sense if there's something here? Or, I mean, are you seeing things that we're not? I mean, what's the deal? I mean, how, sure. how does this place affect you as someone who's sensitive to, I guess, the other side, for lack of a better term? I actually got a physical effect that I felt in my body. And to me, that's a good way to judge. I know a lot of people say you can't trust your feelings, but to me, they're kind of antenna. When we went up on the third floor, I got goosebumps all over, and they told me that that was where some of the people were kept, and we walked down the hallway, and they said it was turned into doctor's offices, which I felt very strongly, it was kind of karmic retribution from the spirits of the people that died there, because I understand a lot of them died iatrogenically, meaning the doctors, through their failure to pay attention to them, actually caused the death of these patients. So their spirits were then ironically able to haunt the doctors that caused their deaths because their offices were put right there. You know, it's like white people building houses on Native American burial grounds and then getting all jacked up by poltergeists, you know? <laughs> Karma has a sense of irony, but I felt it in my physical body as I walked through those chambers and had a reaction. And to me, that's how it always goes. I don't have to like, you know, zone out and get woo-woo. I just feel it like in my flesh. What about speaking in tongues? Um, sure. Is that really associated with possession or knowing a language that shouldn't or normally wouldn't be known to the ones being inhabited? That's a great uh, point to make because there's actually two things that happen and people get them confused. There's a glossolalia and xenoglossy. Glossolalia is what happens in a lot of the Pentecostal kind of places in evangelical where they just kind of like mumble and start going like blah, 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 and not really making sense. But xenoglossy is actually where you speak a language that you don't know. You've never like heard before and it comes out of your mouth. And this was in the Gospels in Corinthians, right? Christ's disciples. 
started speaking to everyone at the assembly in every different language. Although there, none of them knew any of those languages, but it started coming out of their mouths. And there was one of my favorite recorded incidents of xenoglossy. There was a NASCAR race driver. I can't remember what country this is in, but if you Google it, like race car driver xenoglossy, it'll come up. And he got in a car accident in a crash. And when he came out, he started speaking German. But he had no idea how to speak German at all. And all of his friends like, came and they were like, what is happening? And no one understood, but he was fluently speaking to everybody in German. OK, well, thank you so much, you guys. I hope you enjoyed the tour. done yoga in years because my favorite coach actually retired. I was a very strange, bendy little girl. I uh, started as an actress as a child, and then, uh, well, honestly, my older sister wanted to play with something I was playing with, and naturally, well, as big sisters do, you should all know that the doctor or nurse with the dark hair downstairs is my big sister, who helped me to figure out my superpower contortion. <laughs> well, she grabbed both legs and dragged them behind my head, and well, when they kept going, my dad, who's, well, has a history in the circus, kind of went, oh, good, we got one of those in the family. I can make a buck with that. <laughs> and uh, yoga didn't actually fit into my life for a lot of years. I finally tried went, hey, that's not so bad. Um, so I was wondering if you guys, in being a part of this particular movie, if you guys got any kind of like reaction from people in a negative way, or was it positive? Do you want to take that, Bonnie? Sure. Well, number one, <laughs> no one recognized me. <laughs> yes. So fortunately, I was spared a lot of that. Some of the online stuff was fantastic. I was accused of many strange things, from, well, obviously the yoga questions to true possession. Uh, my church liked it a lot. <laughs> well, it was very difficult. They're like, you know, oh, Bonnie's going to Romania. What are you doing, sweetheart? I'm like, oh, Irving, I'm, I'm playing a possessed girl. He's like, oh, well, good for you. When should we all go see it? So I'm like, oh, I don't know if that's a good idea. <laughs> they were very supportive, but in the end, I really kind of was like, prepare yourself for your character in the film? Because Maria, I was very impressed, I must say. Ah, well, um, I, I suppose there are like three different starting points. What, four, probably. It's like, what terrifies the life out of me? And I remembered when I was a kid, it's like you do that zombie walk. It was like the Daleks came out of Doctor Who. And it's like, you know, I am a Dalek. And if you just did it enough, it was like, get away, get away, stop it. You know, it's that kind of like blank expression walking towards you. And then I thought about the crucible, which is a, the Arthur Miller play, which is a, the witches in the play, and, it, and the hysteria, and, you know, the kind of mounting hysteria. And then a bit of Jack Nicholson from The Shining. <laughs> and God bless him. And, um, the fabulous Betty Davis in Whatever Happened to Baby Jane. Um, because I think it's like, I, it, I wanted you know, it to be like the, the, the frightening aspect of it, because it's terrifying when you see somebody in the clutches of possession or you know, an extreme, you know, an extreme circumstance for a human being having some sort of a fit or, um, and I, and I, I kind of wanted, that, you know, I wanted it to be that sort of fear, I guess. Your face expression uh, in some particular scenes of the film is quite real, meaning you totally believe it even if you don't believe in possessions. And I was just wondering how you got there, in other words. You know, to Ah, uh, well, I went down the demonically possessed shop. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know. I guess the, the one on third or the one on, yeah. on Maple. <laughs> I know you want on Maple better. Yeah, we both went there. And the other thing is, of course, you do have to be a redhead, it's clear. You know, it's very in order important. to do, you know, possession, <laughs> you've got to have red hair. There is fear in the ginger. <laughs> I was pretty captivated by your um, performance and uh, did it leave any like lasting effects on 
I knew, I mean, it must have been kind of creepy to get into this space every day, this mindset every day, and having to take that mask off at the end of the day. It must have been sort of a haunting experience for part of it. I mean, you must have had to go to some dark places. Um, well, I, yes. I mean, yes and no. I mean, it's like, I, I, I might, I'm trained as a theatre theater actress, and, and obviously doing a play, you know, doing a play like Medea, night after night, you know, it takes its toll, because you go to even, you know, like, if, you, if this was a difficult place to go, I mean, only in as much as, well, she's possessed by four demons, and, and they all speak in a different voice, but actually, that's great fun as an actress to do. It's terrific fun, so it wasn't such a dark place, but you know, if you're going to where your kids are being murdered, your husband's being killed, there's war, death, faith, then that is really, you know, which is why it takes a long time to come down after doing something intensely like that. With film, you, you have to have that same kind of, you know, ah, kind of holding the energy in like a volcano, but essentially when you've done the performance, when you're doing the performance, it's out, it's gone, you know, so you don't, I don't personally carry it around with me. I'm not a method actress, I would have to say. You know, I, I actually, I, 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 I hold the belief that we're all actors, you know, we've all been kids and that's all it is. It's, it's actually like King, you say, what would I do if I was a kid here? Oh, right, yeah. I mean, that's a bit flip, I suppose. It was a, it was a dark place to, to, we were filming in a, um, a veterinary hospital in Romania, and it was a deserted veterinary hospital, although parts of it were working. And, um, it, you know, there, were, there, were, there was that, you had to shrug it off when you leave. But it's like, film is such fun. Well, I heard it was based on a true story, this movie. Did you do any research to, to sort of look into that, or to support that? Or did you, did, did, did you have any findings for that to sort of help you get into character? Um, yes, it was based on a true story. And yeah, this um, woman did slaughter three members of her church group, and she was being exercised at the time. And um, the, I do watch a lot of, I love true crime, you know, I love, I love crime drama, I love, you know, thrillers and all of that. So yes, and I watch them all, go to sleep listening to, and we'll spray it with luminol. <laughs> so it's like my bedtime <laughs> alibi is luminol. Um, I, and uh, that was that part of it, but I, I, another, not anything else. Uh, I was just curious with the found footage aspect of the film. Uh, in shooting it, did you find that that added a certain level of realism to your acting that maybe wouldn't have been there had it been maybe a straight scripted film? Yeah, I mean, there's a lot, I mean, that, that's a whole other thing, you know, found footage is extremely difficult genre of picture to make because, you know, with every shot you have to establish why the camera's there, otherwise the audience, if they don't believe the camera's not there for a second, so hence the video diary, hence the, you know, the surveillance cameras within the hospital, you know, um, and the, you know, the videographer going to the church to watch, you know, when the, the father is christening the child and that very dramatic sequence. Um, I, it did, it, it, also it's, you know, so not glamorous. <laughs> Just like, oh no, really, I've really got to look that ghastly. Okay. Um, it's, uh, and then, the, the, you know, having the, the camera man, actually, uh, um, Gonzalo Matt, who is the actual director of photography, or was obviously filming, not, not the, the actor playing the videographer. So he was very much in your face. But, you know, after a while, you, 